saying good evening. So we're looking at the Dhammapada again tonight. Continuing with verse 193, which reads as follows. Dulla bho purisa janyo naso sambatta jayati yathaso jayati dhero tangulang sukha medhati which means a thoroughbred man is hard to find, hard to get, hard to find. They are not born everywhere. Yathaso jayati dhero in a place where such a person, such a wise person is born, that family finds great happiness. So there's not much of a story. This is another one of Ananda's questions. Ananda didn't become enlightened until after the Buddha passed away. So you sometimes wonder whether these questions were a part of that. I, I think that's perhaps a little unfair, but he seems to be very much interested in gaining all the theoretical knowledge he can while the Buddha is still around. And I don't think you can necessarily chastise him for it. I don't think the Buddha ever did. But he seemed to understand that Ananda would become enlightened, but um, that is his goal and his intent, his path, because not all Buddhist practitioners have the same path. His path would be one of theoretical study. And so he had many questions just to make sure he understood and that he knew, not just understood, but knew and had in his mind all of these teachings. Apparently he had a very good memory. There are people in the world, you hear about them, they have these photographic memories or something. Apparently Ananda had a very good memory, so he could remember anything, but he had to hear it. So he asked the Buddha many questions, and his question here was, where do you find a thoroughbred human? Uh, he said, you know, the, we know about thoroughbred horses and elephants, and they're actually pretty easy to find. You can find them anywhere, but where can you find a thoroughbred human? So the story says the Buddha took it to mean uh, that, the, that Ananda was talking about a Buddha. And so there's two, thing, two ways we can look at this verse. From the story perspective, we're talking about the Buddha. Where do you find a Buddha? And it's not easy to find a Buddha. It takes a long, long time. It's not just two or three days and then you get a Buddha. A Buddha is something that requires uncountable lengths of time, many, multiple uncountable lengths of time for a person to become a Buddha. They're very rare. They don't just arise up anywhere. So he talked a little bit about the conditions that are required for the arising of a Buddha, what sort of family they'll be born into and that sort of thing. Uh, but from the perspective of the the verse, there's another aspect. Yes, the verse says that it's hard to find a Buddha, but it also says how great or how hard it is to find a thoroughbred person. But it also talks about how great it is for their family, and just how great it is and how much happiness comes from a person who is thoroughbred. And it makes us think of the Buddha's teaching on thoroughbred humans, and it, it seems pretty clear from that teaching that the Buddha didn't reserve this teaching only for Buddhas. This, this designation. So just because someone isn't a Buddha doesn't mean they can't be thoroughbred. So there's two things I want to talk about here. The first one, coming off the story perspective, is a little bit of humility. Because it's easy to think that you're special. And in Buddhism this, this manifests itself as people thinking that they're qualified to become a Buddha. And I think, I'm certainly not a person to put someone in their place and say, you can't become a Buddha. But, but I think the general consensus in our tradition is 
that a lot more people want to become Buddhas than will ever actually attain Buddhahood. So Kundanya was, uh, no, uh, not Kundanya, what's his name? Uh, Kachayana, I think. I think Kachayana, one of the Buddha's chief disciples, uh, was had made a vow to become a Buddha. If it wasn't him, it was someone. And when he came to this life and, and saw the Buddha, he thought to himself, Oh boy, that's just too pure and too perfect. I'm not capable of that. And he gave it up and became a monk. But a lot of people just have the idea to become a Buddha. And I think it can be uh, based on, on this sort of conceit of thinking that you're special. Thinking that you have some special quality that makes you better than everyone else. And so, when I read this first, one of the things I think of is it's a reminder that I'm not a Buddha. I'm not a, a, this kind of a thoroughbred. I'm not anything special. I think that's potentially useful. Of course, you have to be careful not to be too hard on yourself or think of yourself as bad or evil or, or, or corrupt or just useless or pointless. But on the other hand, we have to, to find freedom we have to, to some extent, see how worthless and useless we are. Our bodies uh, and our minds. Because part of letting go is seeing how useless it all is. Part of becoming a Buddha even is to realize how useless the, the person who is the Buddha actually is. Meaning in an ultimate sense, the person, the being, the identity, and even the physical and mental manifestations are in and of themselves of no value. They have nothing that you should cherish or hold on to. So reminding ourselves that we are just ordinary and that our minds are chaotic and unwieldy. Reminding ourselves that we are not something special can be quite useful useful to come down to earth and to not hold yourself up over others or to think of yourself as something special. If you want to become a Buddha, you have to let go of that. If you want to become enlightened, you also have to let go of that. But on the other side, it's important to be encouraged. It's important to remember the greatness of the Buddha's teaching of the practice, the greatness of mindfulness, the greatness of purity of mind, the greatness of greatness, the greatness of goodness. And so we talk about what, it, what is the difference between a thoroughbred and uh, just an ordinary human being, uh, an, an untrainable sort of, if you, think, if you relate it to animals.